All right. Well, good morning. My name is Paul. Um, perhaps you're uh, new here, one of your first few times here. Um, I am the discipleship pastor at Central, and I kind of a privilege to be able to take this time and to open up the Word of God with you this morning. As you can see up there, we are in a series called Frequently Asked Questions, and this is our 10th and final uh, sermon in this series. If you missed a few, you can go online and, and look back and catch up on those. But I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for your participation. If you remember, before we started the series, we asked everyone, do you have any questions? Any questions, biblically-based questions that you would like to see tackled on a Sunday morning? And I'm happy to say we got quite a few responses, and we were able to look into a lot of those questions. So thank you for participating, and that certainly makes us want to do something like this again, where we uh, seek you guys and what you are looking for, what interests you. Um, and that can be a good thing. Well, like I said, this is our last one, and it is, uh, what is communion? What is communion, and why do we observe it? That's what we're going to look to tackle here today. And as uh, Pastor Tanner said, we're going to end by taking communion. But I'd like us to open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, that's where we're going to start off. So I will let you do that. And as you do that, why don't we just spend a few moments in prayer uh, before we get into it. Father, thank you uh, for this day. Thank you for every person who has walked through those doors, Lord. We are so glad to be gathered together. We are glad to have the opportunity to lift up your great name in song, to lift up your great name through the study of your word now, Lord. And we do look to you. Uh, we pray that your spirit would be present in this place and be moving in our hearts, Lord. Teach us things, Lord, pertaining to your person and your glory. Uh, may we better understand the gospel and be a more, more amazed of the sacrifice that you have um, done for us, God. So we thank you for this opportunity, and we exalt your name now and ask your blessing as we study uh, your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so like I said, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. Perhaps you're using one of the Bibles under your chair. Um, if so, um, that's going to be page 485. And I also wanted to mention, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we have a whole lot of them under the seats there. Feel free to take that home, read it, keep it. You never have to give it back. And uh, we just want you to know that that uh, Bible can be yours. And uh, we're excited to be able to do that. But I'm going to start reading in verse 17. So we can go Matthew 26, 17. It says this. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand, and I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared the Passover. They prepared the Passover. Okay, so let's take a few moments. Let's talk about what, what does that mean? What was the Passover? Let's define it. And to do that, we're going to have to flip back in our Bibles to the second book of the Old Testament, and that will be the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 12 um, will be where we land. But before I start reading there, I want to do some catch up. Let's get up to speed here on what has gone on so far in this book. So we read and understand that the Israelites have been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years now. But now God was about to bring about a great work of deliverance, right? He raised up this man, Moses, to stand before Pharaoh and implored him to let the people of Israel go. Now, many of us know this account, right? We know this. Pharaoh refused to let Israel go, and his heart grew harder and harder. And in response to, to Pharaoh's defiance, and through the mighty hand of God, Moses initiates these ten plagues that just utterly devastate the nation of Egypt. But concerning the Passover, we want to specifically focus 
on plague number 10, the final plague. So we read about this 10th plague in Exodus chapter 11, so just a chapter before, and uh, I'm going to read verses 4 through 7. The scriptures say, So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl, who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There should be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Look at that last line again, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Was that because Israel, the Israelites were inherently good and the Egyptians were inherently bad, evil? Had Israel somehow earned God's good pleasure? Was the nation deserving of being passed over from the judgment that was about to come? The answer to each of these questions is an emphatic no. No, not even close. So the question is, how did Israel escape this judgment from Almighty God? And that brings us back to Exodus chapter 12. I'm going to start reading in verse 21. Verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover Lamb. We read a little earlier that this lamb was without blemish. This lamb was one year old. There was some specific guidelines for that lamb. But take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Why were the Israelites spared from this judgment? It was because of the blood of the Lamb. When the Lord saw the blood, he passed over the house and withheld the judgment naturally do them. Now, now, some of you might be a little confused at this point. What does blood have to do with God's judgment? Maybe some of the stuff is kind of new for you. And, and I want to say, stick with me. We're going to connect those concepts as we continue on through this message. But let's do just that. Let's continue. If we were continue, to continue to read this account, we would find that this, that tenth plague, would be the plague that just breaks Pharaoh. Right? He summons Moses, and he looks at him and says, Be gone with you. Take your people, take your flocks, take your herds, and get out of the land of Egypt. And that's exactly what Moses does. And as Israel was leaving Moses said this as they were going out from Egypt in Exodus 13. And uh, let's take a look again at the scripture. Verse 3, Exodus 13. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Jump down to verse 8. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. 
and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt, right? Out of slavery. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. From year to year. Well, let's uh, fast forward about 1,500 years now, right? Uh, Back to Matthew chapter 26. It was that time again. That time of year again. It was Passover. It was time to remember. What are they remembering? Well, it's what we talked about, right? Remember that upon seeing the blood, God's judgment had passed over their Israelite ancestors and smote the Egyptians. It was time to remember God's great deliverance through the incredible Red Sea crossing, which rid the Israelites from the Egyptians once and for all. It was time to remember God's great provision through the manna from heaven. Remember that? The manna from heaven that sustained the Israelites all those years. And it was time to remember God's fulfilled promises, specifically ushering Israel into the promised land, the land that we read about, the land flowing with milk and honey. All of Israel would be celebrating this meal that God, through Moses, had commanded them to come together every single year and rehearse these specific accounts. God wanted them to remember that I am the God who provides. I am the God who who liberates. I am the God who rescues you from your sin. I am the God who delivers you from slavery and makes you sons and daughters. I am that God. And don't forget it. Don't forget it. Remember. Now the disciples that we see here in in Matthew 26, they would have celebrated the Passover a bunch of times, right? Dozens of times since their youth, they would have gathered together with their moms and dads and maybe even sometimes their their communities to, to celebrate the Passover. And this wouldn't have been their first time celebrating uh, with Jesus either. They would have done this before. This is towards right before Jesus goes to the cross, right? So think about it. In their minds, they would have had a pretty good idea. They thought they have a pretty good idea idea of what is going to go on here, what's going to be said, what's it going to be like. This has been going on for 1,500 years, and they've been a part of it for quite a while themselves. But we get to this passage in Matthew 26, and Jesus goes off script, throws kind of a curveball at them, and he says this. Let's take a look. Matthew 26, 26 through 29 says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. For the forgiveness of sins, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now the bread and the cup, these were common elements to have around during the Passover. That was not surprising. And to bless and break the bread and to take the cup and give thanks, these were regular occurrences. These were symbolic elements that pointed back to all that we've covered concerning God's forgiveness, His deliverance, His provision for a people that He has redeemed out of slavery hundreds of years before this time. Yet now Christ says something new, right? He says, this bread is my body. This bread is my body and this drink, this cup is my blood. And that was different. That would have caught the disciples off guard. This is not how it goes. That is not what those elements are mean or are pointing to. 
Again, the Passover has been going on for some 1,500 years, and it has always pointed back to arguably the greatest and most important events in Israelite history. And just like that, just in that moment, Jesus was now pointing the 12 and ultimately every disciple of Jesus Christ to an even greater event. A greater event, that event being his death upon the cross, which would bring about the greatest good this earth had ever known. And at this moment, Jesus instituted what we now call communion, or what we sometimes refer to as the Lord's Supper. Now, I want to get back to the topic of, of blood for a few moments. Again, that might be kind of unique to you. Let's, let's tackle this a little more. If we were to flip to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, we read this in verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Well, that's an interesting verse. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. You see, the blood of that spotless lamb back in the book of Exodus that we looked at represented a means to have one's sin forgiven. And as we read, when God saw the blood, right, it says he saw the blood, judgment passed over that house. But you know, there's a problem with this. There's a problem because truly, as we continue to study Scripture, one lamb could never suffice. One million spotless and pure lambs would never be enough. In reality, no animal's blood could ever take away a man's sin. Rather, it simply withheld God's judgment, God's inevitable judgment for a time. Anyhow, what we end up with in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant is this sacrificial system where the nation of Israel is in a constant state of really sacrificing animal after animal, day after day, month after month, year after year for various reasons and on various occasions all throughout the calendar. So much blood. But again, this blood had no power to forgive sin, just to withhold God's judgment to come a little while longer. I'd like to take, back, take a look back at um, Hebrews chapter 10. This is a pretty cool passage, um, one worth expounding on a bit here. If you want to turn to Hebrews 10, it'll also be on your screen. I'm going to go kind of slow and give some commentary in between. But take a look at this profound passage. Let's look at the first four verses to start. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For since the law, now think old covenant, think sacrificial system, right? Has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. It can never do that. Otherwise, they would have not ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. Now listen to, listen to this. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's impossible. It can't be. The old covenant, along with the Passover lamb, the entire sacrificial system, were only shadows of something or perhaps someone greater to come, right? Shadows. They were pointing to something greater. The true form was yet future and much to be desired, right? For as long as it was simply the blood of bulls and goats, well, these people would still be in their sin. Let's continue to read here. Uh, verse 5, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, talking about the sacrificial system here, you have taken no pleasure. 
Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. He does away with the first order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, listen, once for all. And every priest, they stand daily at his service, right? All the time, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, what did he do? He sat down. He sat down. The work was done. He sat at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds, this new covenant. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Whew, that is quite the passage. There's a lot to consider there. But in essence, the first order, right, the old covenant it's describing was done away with, and the new order, this new covenant was established. The old, the sacrificial system, gone. We no longer have to look back at the shadows of the old covenant, right? Rather, now we can fix our gaze, right, on the substance, the substance of the new. Namely, we fix our gaze on Jesus Christ. We fix our gaze on him. He is the substance and his sacrifice on the cross for the forgiveness of sins is our great reality and focus. Listen to how uh, uh, the scriptures define his sacrifice. It says, once for all, quite a contrast compared to all the animals all year round, a single sacrifice, a single offering perfected for all time, 2,000 years ago and today, for all time who are being sanctified, those who are being sanctified. Now, this is an incredible reality. This should cause us to rejoice. And and look, let's connect the dots here. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, which sums it up beautifully, right? For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Christ is the substance. The lamb in Exodus was the shadow of something greater to come. The lambs in Exodus 12 and the animals for the next 1,500 years were mere shadows pointing us to the Lamb of God, pointing us to Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Passover Lamb. Jesus is our means to genuine, to true, to complete forgiveness of sins. Jesus is our guarantee that the final judgment of God to come upon the world for all the, all the sin of all time, that we, through Jesus, his judgment will pass over us because of the blood that is accounted to our lives. Jesus' blood. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 26 for a few moments here. Um, I might go off course for just a moment, but not really. This is an FAQ series, and one question that is uh, sometimes asked in this passage is, what does Jesus actually mean when he says, this is my body, this is my blood? And this might come uh, come as a surprise to some of you, but this was actually a, a fierce debate, especially around the time of the Reformation. You go back to the 1500s, there was a fierce discussion going on, and the practice of partaking in the Lord's Supper, uh, it, it was no small thing um, in the eyes of many of these reformers of the time. 
And, uh, and although we, we might think, oh, maybe they went a little too far, maybe they're thinking a little too hard, and that could be the case. But I hope we still have an appreciation for the magnitude that they, they held this event. This was important to them. This is something that Jesus talked about, something Jesus initiated. They wanted to understand and they wanted to partake um, in the right manner for the sacred practice. So uh, anyhow, what I want to do is just quickly, hopefully pretty quickly, run through the four predominant views of what Jesus meant when he said, this is my body, this is my blood. And we'll start off with uh, maybe a word you have, have heard before, transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, if you're not associated with this stuff, I've never heard that, but uh, maybe growing up, maybe you have a Catholic background, that's a word that you are familiar with. But this would be the view of the Roman Catholic Church, and therefore it would have been the view of, uh, of the church for throughout the Middle Ages. And uh, this view states that the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ. The priest consecrates the elements during the Mass, and a change uh, to the elements supposedly takes place. The whole substance of the bread changes into the substance of the body of Christ. The whole substance of the wine changes into the substance of the blood of Christ. And, uh, and I, I don't want to go too much deeper into this, but I got reading and wrote stuff down. And, um, but it looks like this goes back uh, a bit. And, and this view seems to actually have been shaped um, by the philosophy of Aristotle. And let me just, just say some quick notes on that. But listen to this. In his attempts to define reality, Aristotle, or going back ancient Greece here, made a distinction between what he referred to as the essential and accidental properties of an object. So what Rome did here is they said the inner core, okay, the innermost core of the bread and the wine, that's what changes into the body and blood of Christ. Even though the physical properties, right, what you see, what you would touch, well, they don't change. Their appearance would remain the same. So that's why, well, it's changing into flesh and blood. It doesn't look like it. Well, they say, well, it's not going to look like it. It's the innermost part of it is changed, not the outside. Now, this is not the view taken by Central Baptists, and, and we have some responses for someone who may hold that view or for the Catholic Church. We would say that that view fails to give sufficient weight to the symbolic character of many of Jesus' statements. Jesus did say, this is my body, this is uh, my blood, but he also in other passages said statements like, I am the true vine. I am the door. Um, he used symbolic language like that often. The symbolism can be seen throughout the gospel. Um, I also want to note that Jesus was sitting with his disciples around the table right then and there, right? He was there in the flesh holding um, that bread in his hand, right? The bread was in his hand, but it was distinct from his body, and the disciples would have obviously been able to recognize that. None of the disciples present would have thought that the loaf and, uh, of the bread and that Jesus held in his hand, right, when he said, this is my body, was actually um, his physical body, because he could see, they could see his body right before their eyes. They would have naturally taken it in a symbolic sort of way. So anyhow, in a nutshell, that's transubstantiation. We'll go a little quicker through uh, the next one here, consubstantiation. There you go, another good word here to remember. Uh, Martin Luther rejected uh, the Roman Catholic view of the Lord's Supper, yet he insisted that the phrase, this is my body, this is my blood, it has to be taken in some sort of literal sense. He just held to that. So he concluded not that the bread actually became the physical body of Christ, but more that the bread and the, of the wine contained <laughs> the body and blood of Christ. He said that the physical body of Christ is present in, with, 
and under the bread of the Lord's Supper. And you could be thinking, oh, this is getting a little too much for me here. But we're, we're going to get through this stuff. But this is the example that was given. He's, it's like, think of a, a sponge with, with water in that sponge. The water is not the sponge, but is present wherever the sponge is present. That is in, with, and under that sponge. So uh, this is not our time period. It's hard to imagine someone in here arguing so fiercely over this, but they were fiercely arguing about their view of what was meant at the Lord's Supper. And again, the magnitude they held it, I think, is to be um, desired. I mean, they, they put much weight on this, and I appreciate that. Let's go to the next view, spiritual presence. John Calvin, another reformer, rejected both of these previous views. He did not believe that the Lord's Supper changed. Um, he did not believe it was contained in. Um, rather, he, he thought the bread and wine symbolized. Okay, feels like we're getting closer to where, where we stand as a church, right? Symbolized the body and blood of Christ, and they gave a visible sign of the fact that Christ himself was truly present. He believed that Christ was spiritually present in a special way as we partake of the, bro- uh, the cup and of the bread. All right, one more. One more. The memorial view, we will call this. The memorial view. Ulrich Zwingli, well, he also believed that the bread and drink symbolized the body and blood of Christ, um, but he backed off on that spiritual presence element, and he stuck, and he said um, that uh, it was simply a memorial. Communion, the Lord's Supper, it's simply a memorial and nothing more than that. Now, as a church, uh, we would fall most in line with, with, with Zwingli with that last memorial view, but I think we can have an appreciation, at least, for what John Calvin um, was saying. Um, but certainly, we symbolize, uh, we believe in the symbolism here, Christ's body and blood. The bread is broken, which represents Christ's body broken for us on the cross, right? The drink is poured, which represents Christ's blood being poured out on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And then, you know, again, the spiritual presence idea, well, we wouldn't exactly land there, but I do believe, and I don't think it's a stretch to believe that when we commune with God, when we enter into communion, we do um, relate to God in, in a special, in a unique way, and I think that's okay to say that. Um, communion is definitely a memorial, no doubt, but let's be sure to meet with God in a profound way, in a significant way, and I think very much so that that is how it was meant to be um, performed. We do not want um, to say something like, ah, it's just the memorial, and, and let apathy, to let indifference come into the practice. That is not okay. That is not good. We meet with God. It is a profound thing. It is a great thing and something to consider very deeply. So that's a quick recap. I'll test you next week on all those, okay? Um, So anyhow, we've looked at the inauguration of what we now call communion or the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, but that's not the typical passage we go to, you know, is it? Uh, we, We tend to turn to 1 Corinthians 11 when we partake in communion, and this is where the Apostle Paul expounds, and he gives some valuable insight, and we see that the Lord's Supper gives us an opportunity for spiritual growth and and blessings if we approach it with the right attitude. And that's what I hope we want to do. We want to approach the Lord's table with the right attitude. So what does that look like? Well, I have three simple points for you on what that would look like. And the first point is we should look within. We should look within. Within. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 30. It'll be on the screen. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the blood, the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body 
eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Those are sobering words and words to, to consider as we partake in this practice. But I want to clarify something here, and I think this is really important. Really consider this today. I want to say this. It's not about unworthy participants. It's about unworthy participation. And there is a difference. Paul did not say that we had to be worthy to partake of the supper, but only that we should partake in a worthy manner. And, and that's a good thing. You know why? Because all of us are unworthy. That's kind of the point. We're looking to the cross. We're looking to Christ. We're remembering we're not worthy. We can't stand before God. We can't come before God. We can't have fellowship with God in and of ourselves. We are all unworthy. The spotlight is never on us. And you know what? Sometimes uh, I'm afraid we, we don't get this right. You know, we see the elements out there, we, and we don't, we don't take them. And we don't take them. And we don't take them because we think, ah, I just didn't have a great month. You know, I, I'm not really walking with the Lord like I should. Month after month after month, and the focus is on us, and I guess we want to get to a point where we come and like, no, I am worthy today. I am going to take it. Again, us, us, I had a good month. That, that's not what it's about, right? It's about Christ. It's about his finished work. We understand that we are unworthy. We are all unworthy, but we're going to strive, and we will take it, in a worthy manner. And that's very important to note, right? Those who partake recognize their unworthiness, but they cling to the cross of Christ as their hope and salvation. And though unworthy and though undeserving, we participate in a worthy manner. How? By examining our own hearts by judging our own sins, by confessing them to the Lord. Again, we look within. We examine within. You know, I love the end of Psalm 139. This is a great communion passage, but it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. We should all be doing that. Search me, God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me. I want to know. I want to walk with you truly. And it says at the end, lead me in the way everlasting. I want to walk with you. Rid myself of sin, apathy. Show me. May I confess. You know, at Central we have communion. Maybe you haven't connected it, but every first Sunday of the month. And that could be another FAQ question perhaps. How often should we take communion? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how often. Um, some churches take it every week some churches monthly like us quarterly annually um, there is no set standard in scripture uh, personally I, I like the idea of once a month i think it's a good practice i think it's appropriate but yeah we do have it once a month and um so really when you walk in it shouldn't really be a surprise right like oh there's communion today i know it's something that we should be prepared for and think of. And I encourage you, it means jot it down on your calendar. Hey, first of the month, first Sunday of the month, there's communion. I want to prepare my heart for that. I want to prepare my heart. Because personally, I think it would be a great practice to handle this aspect, right? The looking within. To handle that aspect of communion before you even ever walk through those doors. I think it'd be great to do that. Look within before you come in. I think that will make the Lord's Supper more of a time of rejoicing than a time of somber prayer. And again, there's nothing wrong with that somber prayer. We do that. But I think if that's done before, just more time for these next two points that I have, things that we rejoice over. Point number two is, uh, what else should we do? We should look back right? We should look back. The broken bre bread reminds us of Christ's body given for us. The cup reminds us of his shed blood. We remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross. We look back. I love this word, remember. Remember. Let's, let's, let's look at the etymology of that word for just a moment here. Remember. 
Okay, it actually means to take something that has fallen off of you and put it back on, to remember. We're going to put this back on. Uh, we, literally to remember by clothing yourself again with something that's yours, something that you once had, once was fastened to you firmly. And uh, listen to this. I think this is... This is kind of a neat statement here. What Jesus is offering his people every time we gather around the table for communion is to put the gospel back on. Put it back on. This thing you once held dear and close and sometimes it just kind of falls off you. You know, let's remember it to our bodies. You know, Martin Luther was once asked by his church, Dr. Luther, Why do you preach the gospel every single week? And to which he responded to the congregation, it's because you forget the gospel every single week. And therefore, he preached and he preached on. And that's what we do at communion. We are remembering the gospel, Jesus' body and blood for us. And finally, point number three, this is a a point we don't often think about maybe, but we look ahead. Look ahead. Look ahead. 1 Corinthians 11, 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He's coming back. The return of Jesus Christ is the hope of the church. It's the hope of every individual Christian. Jesus not only died, He did not only pay for our sins, but then he he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of God. And he said he is coming back for us. He is coming back to take us with him to his Father's kingdom. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the new heaven and the new earth and all the glory of our eternal state. That is coming. We remember that, those truths awesome things and there we have it i challenge you to look within get right with god confess sin look back to the cross of christ look back to the shed blood and look ahead to what we have coming as followers of jesus christ so in a few moments i'm going to lead us in communion and as always and i think it's probably evident throughout this sermon um, we understand that this is meant for Believers, this is meant for Christians, those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for them on the cross. But if if you're not a believer, if you don't know what it means to be a follower of God, that doesn't mean, oh, not for you, go home, not at all. We're so happy you're here. And I encourage you, talk to someone. Talk to a pastor, but not just a pastor. Talk to somebody in this room. Many in this room could talk about what we've been talking about, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and how that changes everything. Everything. Well, I want us to spend a few moments, a few minutes in personal prayer before we partake. And again, if you have not already, look within. Look within, confess your sins before the Lord. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? That's 1 John 1, 9. He is faithful. God is a God of forgiveness. We look back, look back to the cross of Christ and look ahead to an eternity with our Savior. Let's meet with God in a profound way as we remember as we put that gospel back on and claim it as our own, claim it dear to our souls. So let's go ahead and do that. Then I will pray and lead us in communion.
Heavenly Father, there is not one worthy participant in this room. We are not deserving of your great sacrifice. We are not deserving of your astounding love that you have displayed for us on the cross. But yet, Father, we want to partake in a worthy manner. We want to confess and forsake the sins that have overtaken us, Lord. We want to look back to your body broken for us, your blood poured out for us on the cross at Calvary. Father, we want to look ahead to all that you have for all those who are in Christ Jesus, the unfathomable riches of Christ in eternity with you. Father, we love you. We acknowledge you as our creator, our redeemer. We lift your name high. And Lord, now as we partake, we remember, we reacquaint ourselves with the gospel. We love the gospel and bask in its truth. Thank you for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. The scriptures say, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same manner, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take the cup. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And as Revelation says at the very end, come, Lord Jesus.